Hi, this is Sue Burke. Welcome to my podcast. We've always got to be careful about absolutes, but I think everyone listening will agree. If you're sleep deprived, you can't learn, perform, or think as well. But are naps a good thing? The perfect nap is a science based on circadian rhythms. Let's look at the science of napping and how to nap for the biggest brain benefits. Louis loves to nap, so he was far more enthusiastic about this post than our last post about a really cool new ocean mammal discovery. Kidding aside, that's an intriguing post too. He's just afraid to swim. Let's get back to naps. The great news is that there, that there are brain benefits to napping. Ovid thought so. Ovid was a poet born in Sul Sulmol, Italy on March 20th, 43 BCE. His most famous and revered work is Metamorphosis, considered a masterpiece alongside the works of Homer and Virgil. Ovid has quoted as saying, there's more refreshment and stimulation in a nap, even of the briefest, than all the alcohol ever distilled. Others may disagree. For example, Rita Rudner's ex-stepfathers. Miss Rudner reports, my mother was a very tough woman. She buried three husbands and two of them were napping. Which brings me to the interesting question. Why do we sleep for 69 hours then stay awake for twice as long? Most people get their sleep in a single long bout, meaning six to nine hours at night. This is called monophasic sleep. However, evidence is emerging that we may not have been programmed to sleep in this way. Think about it. How would it do for our ancestors to lie down under a tree or even in a tree and virtually be unconscious and vulnerable to predators or the weather for an eight to nine hour, hour stretch. In a word, that would have been dangerous. Sure, cheetahs can sleep all day. The prey has to be a little bit more careful. Studies show that our brains may have been hardwired for biphasic sleep. Defined by the Sleep Foundation, biphasic sleep is a sleep pattern in which a person splits their sleep into two main segments per day. A person or animal may sleep longer at night and then take a nap during the day, or they may split their nighttime nap. The earliest references to biphasic sleep were found in Homer's Odyssey. Yes, more classics. Voluminous evidence points to our ancestors sleeping in two phases. I have several links on my website if you'd like to read the articles. And if you nap regularly, you aren't alone. A Pew study shows that over 30% of adults in the U.S. nap regularly. Researchers had to dig for references to sleep patterns. We sure can't find fossil evidence of sleep patterns. It's hypothesized that during the 18th century, progress in urban lighting in Europe and America, fueled by oil from the darn whaling trade, disrupted the biphasic sleep pattern of humans. Why are lights disrupted to sleep? because of our circadian rhythms. For years, researchers have known that living organisms, including humans, have an internal biological clock that helps them anticipate and adapt to the regular rhythm of the day. Chronobiology is the study of circadian rhythms. Take one 24-hour period. I starve you. You're hangry, of course. What if I take away your water? You're angry and thirsty. But if I keep you awake for 24 hours straight, everyone will notice how compromised you are. Back to circadian rhythm and the fact that naps are a good thing. Life on Earth, as I said, is adapted to the rotation of our planet. The master clock in our brain is a group of about 20,000 neurons that form a structure called the suprachiasmic nucleus. The suprachiasmic nucleus is in the hypothalamus and receives direct input from the eyes. The suprachiasmic nucleus controls the production of melatonin, a hormone that makes you sleepy. The suprachiasmic nucleus, yes, I had to say that once again, receives information about incoming light from the optic nerves, which relay information from the eyes to the brain. When there is less light, for example at night, the suprachiasmic nucleus tells the brain to make more melatonin so you get drowsy. Okay, so we've got light affecting melatonin production via the suprachiasmic nucleus. It's not quite that simple because of adenosine. From the moment you wake up, your brain produces a chemical called adenosine, which is a neurotransmitter that, among many other functions, promotes sleep and suppresses arousal. The longer you're awake, the more adenosine builds up, like steam in a pressure cooker. The time varies, but when adenosine has built to its threshold, you must sleep to release it. 
So what does all this have to do with the science of napping? In 2017, three researchers won the prestigious Nobel Prize for their circadian rhythms research. By studying fruit flies, which have a very similar genetic makeup to humans, they isolated a gene that controls our normal daily biologic rhythm. So there you go. Napping is a science. Humans often experience a biologic drop in alertness in the afternoon. It's a natural part of human circadian rhythm. You're going to be intensely sleepy twice a day. Remember the biophasic sleep evidence? You can't stop it. None of us can. The protein that Jeffrey Hall, Michael Roseblosch, and Michael Young, the Nobel Prize winners, want, uh, found accumulates in cells overnight, then degrades during the day. This process can affect when you sleep, how sharply your brain functions, and more. Humans often experience a biologic drop in alertness in the afternoon. What can we do about this drop in cognitive performance and concentration? Well, we can take five-hour energy shots, energy shots, drink coffee, black tea, because that has the most caffeine, or we can take a nap. A 2008 study showed that naps are better than caffeine when it comes to verbal memory, motor skills, and perceptual learning. Caffeine causes most of its biologic effects via antagonizing all types of adenosine receptors. Caffeine also has adverse effects and doesn't last as long as a 30-minute nap. I, wouldn't, I don't want to bash caffeine or chocolate. I love both of them. But this post, this podcast, is about the science of napping. Naps offer many benefits for your brain and for your body. There is a plethora of nap research out there, and I've got lots of links on my website if you care to read the articles. In brief, napping improves memory formation. The human brain can only store so much information before it needs to recalibrate. Naps improve cognition. Without sleep and the recalibration that goes on during sleep, memories are in danger of being lost. Naps increase creativity, reduce blood pressure and obesity, reduce stress, and they rebalance our emotions, shifting us more towards positivity. Naps also help with logical reasoning. Ask anyone who's dealt with toddlers. Tired equals very unreasonable. Plus, NASA proved that the perfect nap is a science. NASA's extensive research showed that naps will fully restore cognitive function at the same rate as a full night's sleep. I know, that's hard to believe. NASA found naps as short as 26 minutes improved task performance by 34% and provided greater than 50% increase in overall alertness. NASA suggests taking power naps between 10 and 20 minutes, preferably between 1 and 4 p.m. If you get up around 6 a.m., your circadian rhythm will be dipping during that time. So how long should you nap? Well, According to NASA, the ideal nap is 26 minutes or shorter. Even 10 minutes affords our brain great benefits. Longer naps are associated with a loss of productivity and sleep inertia. Sleep inertia is a period of reduced performance upon awakening from sleep. In other words, that awful groggy feeling. Well, how about a half hour nap, or a 60 minute nap, or a 90 minute nap? The benefits that come from napping correlate with what occurs during the four human stages of sleep. In a 2016 study published in the journal Sleep, researchers found that snoozing for 10 minutes can immediately increase alertness and boost cognitive performance for as long as three hours. That's amazing. The reason for this is after just five minutes of sleep, we enter stage two. Stage two of sleep, the brain begins to produce bursts of rapid rhythmic brain wave activity known as sleep spindles. Sleep spindles are most prevalent in stage two sleep. They're thought to play a role in brain plasticity, which is the process of learning and integrating new memories. We enter stage two, two sleep after, in the first cycle after five minutes. Think of sleep spindles as cementing in place what you just learned or experienced. Stage two sleep can last for 10 to 25 minutes during the first sleep cycle. Emphasis on first sleep cycle, which is what's happening when we nap. 
Stage 3 sleep is also known as deep sleep. Experts believe that this stage is critical to restorative sleep, allowing for bodily recovery and growth. It may also bolster the immune system and other key bodily processes. However, stage 3 sleep is important, but it's deep sleep. So if you enter stage 3 sleep during your nap, you may experience sleep inertia, meaning you wake up groggy. When we sleep at night, the brain cycles through all four stages in a pattern lasting 90 to 120 minutes. This means that a 90 minute nap is usually too long, but that's not necessarily the case if your sleep was severely disrupted the night before. You can go through one entire sleep cycle if you've got the time. I don't know who's got the time for a 90 minute nap, but great if they do. So speaking of disrupted sleep, napping isn't for everyone. If you have trouble falling asleep at night or insomnia, staying asleep at night, then napping could interfere. I have a link on my website for the National Sleep Foundation, which has uh, several tips on combating insomnia. So the next time you're feeling drowsy, you could pour a cup of coffee, black tea, exercise, or eat some dark chocolate. Not altogether bad options. But now you know there's another cozier alternative, one that has many cognitive, emotional, and performance benefits. I have to admit that this post took me far longer than usual because I had to take frequent nap breaks. Tell me, do you recharge your brain by napping? Please take a look at my website, www.susanburkcook.com, and subscribe. I'd love it if you would. Thanks for listening to my podcast. Take care.